Okay, good morning. Um, welcome to this uh, workshop on ocean tipping points and extreme events. There are probably still trickling in some people, but we, I think we can start uh, anyhow. Um, at the beginning, we have uh, a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, uh, Doug, can you switch to the next slide? Thank you. So, so it's just a few recommendations and um, uh, so um, thanks for logging in. Uh, please keep your microphone on mute uh, unless you want to speak up and please also uh, uh, use the chat function to ask a question or, or raise your hand uh, so that we can, uh, can um, uh, give you the word in the questions and answer sessions. Um, so um, uh, then uh, maybe you can uh, stop sharing for a second. Um, and um, I would like in the beginning um, to, to say a few words. Um, uh, again, a warm welcome to everybody who, uh, who, who is joining this, uh, this workshop. And um, thanks to the to the funders, in this case, the Research Council of Norway for for this uh, particular event. But it's also associated with uh, two EU projects. Uh, first of all, it's uh, it's a Comfort H2020 uh, project, and it's also TIPAC. So these are two um, projects coordinated from the, uh, within Bergen in Norway um, uh, within a tipping points call that uh, was uh, launched by the EU a few years ago and under the IPCC uh, type of calls and uh, we are ha very happy about the, this opportunity to carry out this research and thanks to the funders. Um, uh, I myself, I'm Christoph Heinzer, I'm the project director of Comfort and I'm a professor in chemical oceanography at the University of Bergen. And uh, we have then also uh, the project director of, uh, um, uh, of uh, TIPAX with us. This is Petra Langeburg from NOSI Research. Um, and then uh, several PIs uh, in, in the Comfort project. This is Friedrich uh, Fröp uh, uh, from the University of Bergen. This is Jörg Schwinger from NOSI Climate. Uh, also in Bergen and uh, Gian Trang from the Geomar in Germany. And um, uh, we are uh, uh, also very happy to have Rolf Rödwen with us, who is a, a partner of uh, in the, or a, a member of the um, uh, stakeholder reference group for uh, the Comfort project. Uh, and he is uh, um, the executive secretary of, of the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. Um, we gen then uh, um, uh, just uh, go into the into the workshop, and uh, I'm happy to announce the, the overview talk. Um, I, I also have one uh, uh, announcement for the change in an agenda that, that I forgot. Uh, I, we will swap the talks by Gian Trang and Jörg Schwinger in order to make the sequence more logical. So we found out that it fits better during a rehearsal session yesterday. So, um, but we start with this overview talk uh, on abrupt changes, regime shifts and tipping points, uh, potential impacts on Norway. And the speakers are Friederike Fröp and Petra Langebroek. So Friederike Fröp is a postdoc at, at UIB and specializes in the moment on, on um, uh, ecosystem impacts of tipping points. And she has also a lot of experience in carbon cycle research. And then Petra Langebroek is an ice sheet specialist uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, a senior scientist at, uh, at, uh, at uh, or we've, uh, on the research professor equivalent at, at NORSE, and she is leading the, the TIPAX project. So um, we, I then give you work to, uh, the, the word to Friederike and, uh, and Petra, and we look forward to your presentation. I can see, I can see the presentation, perfect, thank you. Yes, good morning everyone, welcome. Thank you, Christoph, for the uh, kind introduction. And we jump right in. So um, I will start uh, with this presentation that I give together with Petra Langebrück about the abrupt changes, regime shifts and tipping points and their potential impacts on Norway. So we in the scientific community, but also stakeholders in the wider public are more and more concerned about tipping points. And for example, when we read the last 
summary for policymakers of the IPCC synthesis report that just came out two weeks ago. Um, there they say that the likelihood and the impacts of abrupt or irreversible changes in the climate system, including those changes that are triggered when tipping points are reached, these impacts increase with further global warming. So that means that if we warm the earth even more, these tipping points are uh, potentially reached um, sooner. Um, tipping points, what are tipping points when we talk about this? We need to clarify this first before we jump into the rest of uh, this workshop. So you can um, imagine any system wants to be in its most stable state. And we can um, illustrate this by this ball that is in a valley, um, such as here. And now if you put pressure on that ball, you can shift it into a state that is no longer stable, that is very much unstable, like on the tip of this uh, mountain here. And if you push just a little bit more, this ball will fall down very quickly into a different stable regime and eventually ends up down here. And now you can imagine going back is actually quite hard. Um, so we need much more energy to push the ball back into this first stable regime. And the same applies in the climate system, right? Um, this point here on the top of the mountain, this is actually what we call the tipping point. This is the threshold that we needed to cross to go from this first stable regime into a different stable regime. So any gradual change or a shock-induced change that may force a stable system to reorganize into a new, different stable regime. Um, this is uh, basically um, possible if we cross a critical threshold or the tipping point. Um, and the regime shift, these regime shifts going from regime A to B, um, these are often re irreversible. So even if we abate this uh, driving mechanism that pushed the ball out of its uh, comfort zone in the first place, um, returning to the initial state is very often not possible. However, <laughs> when we look at the climate system, we not only have one tipping point or one of these critical fascials, we actually have a lot. And we find a lot of potential tipping elements um, in the physical climate system, in the biogeochemical climate system, and in the ecosystem. And they may actually uh, trigger one another. So we have cascading effects, um, which makes it really complicated. So you have seen this map on the invitation before. Um, it shows a range of uh, potential tipping elements. And as you can see, we find them in the entire globe. They are everywhere. They are uh, found in the atmosphere. They are found uh, on land and they are found in the ocean. And this is where our main expertise actually lies um, and what we research um, the tipping elements in the, uh, in the ocean or on, on uh, uh, yeah, uh, those uh, related to, to, to ice. Um, and don't worry, we are not going to cover them all now in this overview talk. We will just give some examples for these uh, tipping elements. And we will start with one out of the physical climate system um, about tipping elements on Antarctica. And I will hand now over to Petra, who um, will continue. Uh, please. Thank you, Frederike. So my name is Petra Langebroek and I'm the scientific coordinator or one of the scientific coordinators of the TIPAX projects. Uh, and I will talk here a little bit about tipping points in Antarctica. So I'm talking mostly about the Antarctic ice sheet, which is this huge mass of ice at the South Pole. If you can go to the next slide, Frederica. Yeah. So the Antarctic continent is, is more or less entirely covered by ice. There are some mountains here and there, and there's some places where there is no ice, but there is a lot of ice on Antarctica. 
I sometimes I work with this eyesheet already for a while, and I still find it difficult to imagine the enormous size of the ice itself. In many places, the ice is more than four kilometers thick. Imagine that. So if all of that ice would melt, then that what that ice will melt to water. The water will flow into the ocean and sea level will rise. If all of that ice would melt, sea level will rise by almost 60 meters. Now, ice is not melting so quickly, so this will take a lot of time. So 60 meters will take in the order of thousands to ten thousands or maybe hundred thousands of years. So don't worry directly about this. But sea level is rising and the Antarctic ice sheet is impacting also the global sea level rise that we see now. So this figure from the IPCC report shows the sea level rise for the last 70 years and the coming 80 years. Um, and the current sea level rise, if we think about the global mean sea level, it's mostly due to two factors. The first one is the thermal expansion of the ocean. So when ocean waters warm, they expand and they can only move upwards. So that means that sea level rises. And this is about 40% of the signal that we see today. So this has nothing to do with the ice itself. But the other part, around 60% of the sea level rise today, is due to the melting of ice from all over the world. So the melting of glaciers, but also the melt melting of the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets. So today sea level rises in the order of three to four millimeters per year, but we see a trend that this is increasing and increasing. Uh, and in this figure, you can also see the different projections. So depending on if we follow an uh, extreme climate scenario, more the red lines, or a more moderate climate scenario, the blue lines, uh, sea level rise by the end of the century is projected to be between half a meter and one meter higher than today. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, and uh, I show here also uh, the stippled line, and this is um, uh, this is a low likelihood but high impact uh, storyline. So in the normal IPCC scenarios, we cannot include um, many of the more um, uncertain processes. So especially not like tipping point processes, they are not included in these lines of projections because we are studying them now. <laughs> so they cannot be included in, in the reports um, that were published a few years ago. So, but uh, in an attempt to acknowledge that there is a possibility for a much larger sea level rise, uh, the stippled line is included also in the IPCC report. So sea level is rising and it's a uh, sea level rise of um, more than 15 meters in, in uh, the year 2300. So that's still a while, but more than 15 meters cannot be ruled out. Uh, so we really need to understand what is happening in Antarctica. Because this is for a large part then due to Antarctica. So what is happening in Antarctica? So in West Antarctica, the ice sheet is losing, losing mass. So we are losing ice mostly in West Antarctica. While in East Antarctica, the ice sheet is actually growing a little bit. And that's because there is more uh, snowfall in the west, in the Eastern parts because of a slightly warmer climate. Um, the ice shelves around Antarctica, they are melting, they are thinning. So they become thinner and thinner. And this is most likely due to ocean warming. Um, Yes, next slide, please. So in order to explain this, it's easier, easiest to um, like cut through the Antarctic ice sheet, like you cut through a cake. <laughs> and then in a very schematic image, I show here how it looks like. So we have ice, the ice sheet itself based on land here on the left side of the figure. And the ice flows into these ice tongues all around Antarctica, which you call ice shelves, or in Norwegian, isbremmer. Um, these are in contact with the ocean and therefore also very vulnerable of what happens in the ocean. Now, in many of the underneath many of the ice shelves and even the larger ones, the Filsnerona and the Ross ice shelves, um, more it happens more and more that warm waters come really close to to the ice shelf and they melt the ice shelf from below. So the ice shelves have a very special. Um, 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 uh, they are very special for the Antarctic ice sheet because they protect the ice. 
they, they make sure that the ice that flows from land doesn't flow as fast. So when ice shelves thin or even melt away entirely, the ice from Antarctica will flow faster and we will have a much faster sea level rise. The ice sheet then will also retreat further inland, which causes a feedback loop, a tipping point to be crossed, uh, where the ice um, melts and retreats faster and faster. So it's exactly that tipping point that we are studying in this TIPOX project. And that I will tell you a little bit about our latest fi findings now. So the question, so we know that the ice sheet is retreating, especially in, in West Antarctica, and we know it has something to do with the ocean warming, but we don't know if it really already crossed the tipping point or not, because the ice sheet can also just be following the ocean warming um, itself. So we did many, many simulations. Yeah, many, many simulations where we artificially uh, warmed the ice shelves a bit more, more from below. So we, we, we are melting the ice, ice shelves here artificially in numerical models, so in many different ice sheet models. And then we take away uh, this heating so this forcing, and then look at what happens with the ice sheet. So is it following this case A? So it goes back to its original state. So actually the ice sheet is stable. Or is it going in this runaway effect, this feedback loop where we have crossed the tipping points and where the ice sheet retreats faster and faster? So this case B. So I won't show you lots of wiggly curves from simulations, but just um, I, I just have basically two messages here. One is good and one is bad. So the good news is that uh, currently the Antarctic ice sheet looks to be in a stable state. So when we take away this forcing that we applied, this extra heat, uh, the ice goes back to its original state and uh, that means that if we could stop somehow the warm waters to, to come uh, close to the ice shelves, uh, then the ice retreat will also stop. The bad news is that we also run our simulations a little bit longer. And if the ice sheet retreats a little bit further inland, then we actually in many places reach this tipping point where especially in West Antarctica, the ice sheet will cross the tipping point and, uh, and will continue to retreat, even if we could stop uh, global warming. So this is a policy event that was initially meant for Norway. So uh, I know there are some international speakers here, uh, uh, listeners too, but I still have a few slides about Norway and sea level here too. Um, so Norway is a very special case because we do have, of course, this global sea level rise, but in Norway there was a huge ice sheet uh, on top of Scandinavia in the last glacial period. And that ice sheet that pushed the land down, uh, and while most of the ice has melted, except for some glaciers and some ice caps, um, the land is still, feel, is still going up. So it's still rebounding after that last ice age. So the land in Norway is actually going up. And this is more, um, this is a higher rate in, in central Scandinavia. So it's a higher rate in Oslo than it is in Bergen. And you can see this in a schematic figure on the, re on the right hand side. So that means if we look at the sea level in Oslo and the sea level in Bergen, um, in Oslo, actually the sea level is going down because this effect of the rebound is larger than the global mean sea level rise. While in Bergen, these two effects, they compensate each other. So in Bergen, we have a quite, uh, we have actually no real trends in the sea level today. In the future, um, we have also done simulations for all, all around uh, Norway, how the sea level will rise in, in the future. And of course, this depends again on the climate scenario. So in low emission scenarios, um, this is not so dramatic, but in higher emission scenarios, also all around Norway, we will have an impact of sea level rise. So in Norway, the policy makers or the planners, they work with something that's called Klima Poslag. So that's basically a number that they use um, based on one of the more extreme scenarios of, uh, of how, for how much sea level rise they should uh, plan in the different cities. So in Bergen and in Oslo, 
by the end of the century, they use an, a number in the order of 50 to, let's say, 70 centimeters. So all these numbers are though based on, on the old simulation. So we're working on a new report, which is to be released this year uh, on sea level rise in Norway. So that's all I would like to say about sea level and ice sheets and tipping points. So now I give the word back to you, Friederike. Thank you. All right. Um, I would like to continue with um, some examples of a tipping point from the biogeochemical system and the ecosystem. Um, when we talk about biogeochemistry, um, we actually uh, need to start with the triple threat to the oceans um, because we see three different uh, changes that are due to the rising emissions of anthropogenic CO2 and other greenhouse gases. That is the warming of the ocean, so the warmer or the more CO2 we find in the atmosphere, the warmer the sea surface gets and, and the more heat is actually eventually taken up by the ocean. At the same time, the ocean acidifies. So the more CO2 is in the atmosphere, the more CO2 eventually is taken up by the ocean. And that results in a drop in pH. So the water becomes more acidic. And we also observe deoxygenation. So the warmer the water is, the less oxygen it can hold. And all these different driving mechanisms, they are not tipping points per se, but they act synergistically. They enhance each other's individual effects and they act globally. Um, they have some regional features, but we need to be concerned about them. So this is a figure that was uh, published three years ago that basically shows something uh, that, that shows the warming of the sea surface over time, um, uh, over the historical period here in black, and then following different emission scenarios that Petra mentioned as well just now. So if we emit a lot of uh, anthropogenic CO2 in the future, um, we will observe a stronger warming until the end of the 21st century compared to a scenario that is um, uh, that is in line with uh, the Paris Agreement. Um, that means we're two degrees Celsius of warming by the end of uh, 2100 are not uh, crossed. And in these scenarios, the warming is, uh, is less strong at the sea surface. So this is the same figure, but for the ocean pH, um, showing the same scenarios. So if you um, basically add more CO2 in the atmosphere, the ocean becomes more and more acidic. And this drop in pH is, is much stronger by 2100 for a strong emission scenario than it is for a scenario that is uh, compatible with the Paris Agreement. Uh, then this uh, water, the surface water, but also the deeper ocean will not acidify as much. And the same applies for the oxygen. So for the oxygen, the loss of oxygen in the water column is uh, more severe um, by 2100 in a strong emission scenario than it is for, uh, for these uh, low emission scenarios. And for the oxygen, it is really an, an effect of, of a loss of solubility due to the warming. So warmer water can hold less oxygen, but at the same time, um, the warming also affects uh, the mixing of the water. So less uh, oxygen can be brought from the surface ocean to the deep ocean. And um, then it has also something to do with consumption by organisms. So it's, it's a very complex uh, feature here. But all of these different um, processes are um, they, they have their own critical thresholds, which is what we care about. So for example, for the warming, um, when, when you look at fish or, or other marine organisms, then they need an optimum temperature under which they perform best. Um, 
but as soon as we heat too much, uh, those fish or organisms can no longer perform as well. So they no longer swim as fast or they no longer can um, reproduce as good as they could. And they have a critical threshold. And if like a maximum temperature is crossed, then um, those fish can no longer survive. For acidification, it's a bit more tricky. We don't know for all organisms how they actually respond to changes in pH. Um, there are some species that actually show no response to changes in pH, but about a third of the species that were researched actually show a negative response to this very acidic water. And these species are those that build up calcium carbonate shells. So they build up a skeleton that can be dissolved in, in acidic waters. Um, and for oxygen, we also find these uh, critical thresholds. Um, fish, just as we need um, oxygen to breathe, and if the oxygen drops to a below a certain threshold, then those fish simply suffocate. But the quantification of these thresholds or these tipping points, this is really challenging because um, every species has their own threshold, every population has its individual threshold. So more often it is easier to actually identify the regime shift than where the critical threshold was in the first place. And I'd like to show you an example of one of these regime shifts. Um, we observe now more and more marine heat waves. Um, marine heat waves occur in every um, uh, ocean of the world. It simply means that sea surface temperatures are extreme for a long period of time. And these uh, marine heat waves, they impact the physical system over land, so they can impact weather patterns, but they also affect marine ecosystems. If it is exceedingly warm or hot in the water, then fish start to become uncomfortable. And they also can affect um, coastal fisheries because of that. And we know that some of these heat waves that we observed in the past decades, they are very likely caused by anthropogenic climate change. Not all of them, but most of them. And one of these heat waves, the one in 2012 in Western Australia, that actually caused a regime shift in a marine ecosystem that we observed. Usually at the coast of Australia, uh, or is this covered with a kelp forest that looks like this. Um, and this figure shows how over time, this kelp forest uh, has collapsed and disappeared completely and was um, replaced by the seaweed turf. And this is a direct consequence of a marine heat wave that is shown behind here in these red colors, like this very strong temperature anomalies that caused this shift in, in this marine ecosystem. So we know that these extreme events in the ocean, they can trigger a persistent change in the ecosystem. However, we don't really know where the threshold was in the first place. The problem now is that we not only find extreme temperatures or the seed waves in the ocean, but also um, we find extremes in acidification and in oxygen as well. And we call that a compound extreme because they can co-occur, they can occur at the same time and in the same place. And this is shown in these maps here for the surface ocean on the left hand side and for 200 meter depth on the right hand side. And you see basically that these compounding extremes, they can, they, they take place in the entire ocean and um, at all depths. However, how they impact organisms, that remains really not so well understood. So we don't really know when and where critical thresholds, that is where tipping points are crossed. 
how Norway could be impacted. I'm now just showing one example here for a deep sea habitat um, for cold water corals, because I don't know if you're aware, but we have also corals in Norway. Um, these are shown in these maps here as these dots. Uh, they sit on the on on the on the floor on the sea floor on the shelf, and they are very uh, dependent on a certain level of uh, pH, and they respond very um, quickly to changes in pH. And this is an example for different future scenarios of how acidic the water is over time. Um, from a low to a high emission scenario. Um, when the water is more red, then um, the water becomes corrosive and actually bad for these, for these deep water corals. And if it's blue, then they are uh, not affected as much. And you see the higher the emission scenario is, the more reddish all the colors become. And these cold water corals are therefore likely exposed to these corrosive waters if the two degree warming target is not met. And then these uh, coral reefs, along with the ecosystems, are um, yeah, very likely to, to collapse um, if emissions aren't ab abated. However, how fish stocks are affected, if we add to this change in acidification, also the warming and the loss of oxygen, um, that remains uh, that, that we don't know yet about. We don't know how these drivers act together and affect marine habitats. Um, this is very much an open research question. So I want to conclude here that we find tipping points in the physical and biogeochemical system as well as in the ecosystem, and they are likely to be crossed if we don't cut our emissions. And the impacts of crossing one tipping point or a cascade of tipping elements, that is not well known, neither globally or locally in Norway. And this uncertainty is really a problem. So this uncertainty associated with the probability of abrupt changes, regime shifts, and tipping points. This is very much a challenge for any adaptive measures that need to be taken. Thank you so much. Um, that was it from our side. And now we can take some questions if there are any. I will stop sharing my screen now. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Friederike and uh, and Petra for for this uh, nice presentation. We are a little bit behind in time, but it don't, this is fine because we have a little bit of buffer at the end of the workshop, so this is not critical. So we can can go go for um, uh, questions and answers uh, um, a bit now. And um, so, please, if you want to want to. Uh, uh, ask something or comment on something so please uh, raise your hand and uh, and speak up and you are welcome so usually my, often people need a few seconds to think <laughs> uh, but uh, now it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity also to to ask questions and uh, we will also have the opportunity at the end of the workshop uh, there's a longer longer interval also for a longer period for uh, reserved for discussions and but if you have directly now some questions on what has been said up to now so please uh, raise your hand and your voices <laughs> There is one, uh, and it's Aurora. Please. Thank you. Um, very interesting. Uh, and I was curious about um, your research on Antarctica because you said that the Antarctic ice sheet is currently in a stable state, and um, but with further warming, um, it could possibly tip. And what was that warming? <laughs> Do you know? Uh, is there an you know um, interval of? What sort of warming are we talking about? I know it's different between West Antarctic and East Antarctic, but is it similar to what we've seen in previous literature? Yeah, so it's really difficult to say exactly how much warming 
<laughs> that's exactly the tricky points uh, what we are still studying and and like you also also mentioned it really depends on where you look at in Antarctica so there are glaciers in West Antarctica that are already retreating and some people also think that they those have already crossed tipping points so um like Twaits glacier for example that's that's one typical one where which is even often called Dooms Glacier in the literature. Um, so for our simulations, because we really wanted to know if something was stable or not stable, we had we had to induce some um, uh, more. Uh, we, we could not really look at the climate forcing like it is today. So we had to create a stable system in order to test if it crosses one from one regime to another regime. So um, that makes it a little bit complicated to translate to what's really going on today, because today we don't have a stable system. The ice sheet is, um, is retreating in some places. So it's more when we look at the whole of Antarctica that we can say, OK, it looks like it is relatively stable, but in specific places we are close to close to or maybe have already crossed some of the tipping points. And the warming that I'm talking about is um, in some places um, in the Southern Ocean, the ocean is a little bit warmer. So in those, so especially at the coast of West Antarctica, uh, so Amundsen Sea region, there, there the glaciers are therefore also more vulnerable. Uh, what we are really worried about more is this really big, um, ice shelves, so the Filsnerona and the Ross ice shelves, because we always thought that they would be incredibly stable because they are so large and they kind of make uh, their own barriers. It's really difficult for warm waters to actually reach below those ice shelves. But uh, research from uh, also our colleagues, um, Elinda Relius and Svein Oster Osterhus, so they have, have done measurements there and they actually find that warm waters can penetrate also below these ice shelves, the large ones, so the Filsnerona one, for example. Um, the question is that we don't really know if this is now something that happens occasionally <laughs> or if this will continue to happen all the time in the future. And that would really influence how quickly these ice shelves will melt. Yeah, thank you. I hope I didn't make it now too complicated, but <laughs> yeah. Thanks for asking this question. Yeah, maybe I have a I have a short question to 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 Friederike also concerning concerning the acidification and 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 northern and the high latitudes and, and especially in, in northern high latitudes. So the probability that that these, uh, for example, the cold water corals or other keystone species in the food web like pteropods for 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 feeding fish, um, how likely is it? And can you maybe comment on the on the the this kind of Arctic amplification also for the acidification? I mean, it is really much dependent on the future emission pathway uh, that we take, how likely it is that um, the deeper ocean will become more acidic. Um, so far, I would be quite optimistic that we managed to turn the ship around. <laughs> and. Um, the problem is with these deep water corals uh, that they are not just affected by the acidification itself. That is, uh, in the Nordic seas, um, quite dra dramatic because the waters itself are very cold and very uh, much affected by only small changes in pH that will result already in quite a strong response. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it, it, it's not just the it's not just the acidification, but it's also the drop in oxygen and it's the 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 warming itself. Okay. And these triple uh, these 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 multiple stressors that affect organisms that is very difficult already to study in um, in in experimental setups that, that uh, marine biologists do, but to observe that in the open ocean, it's very very complicated. And we can make these assessments in, in global models and try to assess how 
um, the ambient conditions will change in the future, but how uh, on a very small scale locally the response will be for an organism, for an ecosystem, for, for a population, that that is a, it's a big task. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you very much for your answer. I, I suggest that we get get uh, go then uh, ahead with the uh, with the next talk. And as announced before, we have swapped the two talks by by Gian Tran and and Jörg Schwinger. So Jörg will talk now, and and uh, Jörg is uh, uh, is employed at North Climate, and he is probably one of the the key scientists when it comes to the global ocean biogeochemical model in the Norwegian Earth System model. And um, he is uh, probably the most knowledgeable person uh, in uh, uh, about all the, the model details. And um, we are very happy to have you around and with a very intriguing title. Um, uh, emit now, mitigate later, Earth system response to zero and negative emissions. Uh, I can see your slide and the floor is yours, Jörg. Yes, thank you very much for this nice introduction. Um, yeah, I'm I'm taking now a bit um, Earth system modeling perspective to explore how we would see the response of the Earth system if we really would go to zero emissions. And I set this negative in, in, in brackets here because I don't really have time um, to go into this, unfortunately. So let me begin with this very nice slide that was made by by Christoph a few years ago, um, showing or uh, visualizing what, what an Earth system model actually is. Um, it, it, it shows the, the different components of the Earth system, the, um, the atmosphere, um, the ocean and the land surface, and also the biogeochemistry in the ocean and in the land surface with the arrows um, describing processes and feedbacks between these components. So the details of, of this are, of course, here in, in this context, are not important at all. This is just to, to, to illustrate that these kind of models have grown quite complex over the, the past uh, decades and include a lot of processes and feedbacks. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, the most important finding made possible by this, this class of models is actually quite simple. And it's like this. It just tells us that um, the global warming level that we will see or see is um, just a proportional a linear function of accumulated um, CO2 emissions. And I'm saying um, that this is the most important finding because it has a very important consequence. And this consequence is there is a carbon budget that we have if we want to reach a certain temperature goal. So if we want to reach 1.5 or 2 degrees, we can use this finding easily um, to look up how much CO2 emissions can we emit in total. And this is our carbon budget. And once this is exhausted, we need to have zero emissions. Otherwise, the temperature would continue to rise. <clears throat> Um, yes, so, but in, in, in the past, um, Earth system model simulations have been very much focused on simulating scenarios where we increase um, the CO2 and where we do have um, climate change. And still relatively little is known about the, the Earth system, how the Earth system actually reacts when, when the emissions go to zero or become net negative. Um, Therefore, we have taken our Earth system model, the Norwegian Earth system model, NORESM, and have done some idealized simulations um, where we have 100 years of emissions. That's here in these gray shaded areas, um, the area that we have emissions. And what is shown here is the cumulative emissions. So in the first 100 years, the cumulative emissions go up. And then after 100 years, the emissions become zero. And therefore, the um, cumulative total stays, stays constant thereafter. And we have simulated different levels of emissions. <clears throat> and then if we apply our simple rule that um, global warming is proportional to um, the cumulative 
CO2 emissions, then this looks like this, like these dashed lines here. It's just a scaled, scaled version of the cumulative emissions. Um, and having done that, we can now compare the real temperature that is simulated by Nori SM. Um, <clears throat> and we see that it, it, it works quite well with our simplified assumption in, in the start when the emissions are positive. And then it also works to a lesser degree, but it's still, let's say it works um, okay-ish towards the end um, of, of, of the simulations. But in between, there's quite a big um, <clears throat> deviation for at least um, 200 years, where the temperature is actually kind of lower than, than, than we would expect. And um, to explain this a bit, I'll show you in the next slide a map of, uh, um, of, of temperature difference between these two um, points in time. So one at these kind of um, minimum of temperature and, and then when the temperature kind of has recovered. And as you see here, um, the cooling that, that, that we see here is concentrated in the northern higher latitudes, north of, let's say, 40 degrees, and it's concentrated around the North Atlantic region. So it is a consequence of changes in ocean circulation, actually, as you will see here. Um, so here is, is shown an index of the Atlantic Ocean circulation. And all of you probably know that, that the Atlantic Ocean circulation transports a lot of heat towards the north through the Gulf, Gulf Stream and the related um, circulation systems. Um, and this is an, an, an index of these uh, circulation. So if this goes down, the circulation becomes weaker. And then if it goes up again, it, it, um, <clears throat> the circulation recovers. And um, <clears throat> So this this is um, these 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 Atlantic Ocean circulation was also shown as a, a tipping tipping element in in the first slide that that Friederike showed, and here it it is in our model simulations and also in other Earth system uh, um, uh, simulations it's not really a tipping point in the sense that it is reversible. So it it goes down, but then if you stop the emission, it, it, it goes back to almost the same level. So in that sense, it's not really a tipping point. Um, but still, I will show you um, what, 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 what impact um, this, this uh, behavior would have, even if it's not a tipping, but if it's just a strong reduction. Um, <clears throat> so here, if we now look at the temperature north of 40 degrees north, you see that these um, decrease in, in, in ocean circulation strength um, leads to a quite large fluctuations in, 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 in the temperature. So we have the initial warming here and then it becomes quite a bit cooler. And when the ocean circulation recovers, um, we, we go to a level of kind of the final, final warming level that, that we have. If we have a scenario with less emissions, the effect is also there, um, but it's much smaller. And in the temperature, it is also much, much um, smaller than in um, the simulation with more emissions. So we get these warming, cooling and warming cycles. And <clears throat> why would we care about that? I mean, cooling, cooling would be good if we, um, if we, go go to zero emissions and um, the atmosphere would cool that that would be positive wouldn't it well i think it's not um not that simple because actually what we would like to have is stable climate conditions stable climate conditions are beneficial and large fluctuations are detrimental <clears throat> because they will put additional pressure on ecosystems and uh, last but not least, make adaption to climate change more challenging. So, in addition to that, the higher temperature, uh, the higher emission pathways, of course, ends up with higher overall temperatures. It also has these large climate fluctuations 
which makes it much worse than the pathway with lower emissions. <clears throat> um, and I'll show you an, an, an example of impacts that these large fluctuations can have. Um, and here I have chosen the sea ice. Um, this the map here shows the, um, the, the, the summer sea ice extent. And then we have areas marked in different colors. The, the, the blue uh, color, the light blue color here is, is an area where we have the sea ice all the time all the time regardless of, of, of um, what's happening so this is a uh, stable stable sea ice but then here the red area is um, sea ice that has initially with the warming has disappeared has melted then in the intermediate cooling period it has been re regrown so it, it there was sea ice cover again and then in the warming phase it thought again, so it kind of rethought. Um, we also see such effects on permafrost, and there will also be impacts on ecosystems, like um, the what um, Frederike also showed. The, the um, temperature tolerance of fish will be impacted by fluctuations of two degrees. Um, <clears throat> So with that, I'll come already to my take home messages and I have a disclaimer first. So um, our Norwegian Earth System model is a well-tested model and it has been used a lot also in IPCC reports. But nevertheless, there is a large uncertainty regarding the sensitivity of ocean circulation to warming. So um, actually Earth System models disagree there are models, also other models, that show a strong sensitivity of the ocean circulation to warming, but there are also some models that don't show an as strong or a, a much weaker um, sensitivity. So in that sense, the results that I have presented here is, is kind of if-then results. <clears throat> so if the ocean circulation declines strongly and recovers, then we will see long-term warming cooling cycles uh, and with this uh, disclaimer at the beginning, um, my, my, my take home messages are, so the, if the Atlantic Ocean circulation is weakened due to global warming, we will see century long effects, even if we reduce emissions to zero. So once the circulation has been weakened, it is too late. We can't, um, then, then it will take a long time a relatively long time for recovery and we will see these large climate <clears throat> fluctuations but there seems to be a threshold below which the effects remain relatively small there will be impacts on sea ice permafrost and ecosystems of these large climate fluctuations and my fourth point is which i didn't show because of a lack of time here but if we would remove carbon artificially from the atmosphere, something that is covered in, 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 in the next talk. So if we would apply carbon dioxide removal to kind of get to a, a cooler climate, these warming, cooling, warming cycles, these climate fluctuations can be even amplified. So, and then taken together all these points, um, the most important message, which is probably clear, um, is that reducing emissions very fast is much less risky than delaying mitigations. Yes, and with this, I thank you for listening. If you're interested in, in this, there is a publication out where also these negative emissions are covered. I copied it here. Yes, and otherwise, thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, if you can maybe stop sharing for a second. Yeah. I think I suggest that we take the questions and answers after the also the, the two next talks uh, or the or the or all the other talks uh, in 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 this uh, uh, Q and A session at the end of the of the uh, of the um, uh, workshop. But if there are uh, questions, technical questions or direct uh, uh, things that uh, people want to clarify now, that's of course possible. If you have a 
a quick question on the on the talk and specifically. So I wait a few seconds. Otherwise, I suggest that we have a, a, a very short break, uh, a few minutes, a five minutes break. Um, uh, just if you want to grab a cup of coffee or tea or uh, do uh, anything else and then uh, in order to relax for a few minutes and then we jump into uh, into uh, Gian uh, uh, Trunk's uh, uh, talk then uh, in five minutes. Thank you very much Jörg for this nice presentation and see you in five minutes. Thank you. So hello everybody, we, in a few seconds we will start again. I just wait until the clock goes to 10.30. Um, and um, 
welcome back. And as I said before, there are uh, opportunities to for for discussions and questions of answers and uh, questions and answers at at the end after after we have uh, all the presentations carried out. Uh, but also in in if you have specific uh, technical questions directly to the talks, and don't hesitate to raise your hand or arm. Uh, the, Okay, then we uh, it's 1030 and um, we have the uh, pleasure to um, uh, listen to Jian Tran, who is a, um, a research scientist or postdoctoral, postdoctoral researcher at uh, the Geomar um, Ocean uh, Research Center and in, in Kiel in Germany. And uh, she's a specialist on carbon dioxide removals and, and, and uh, corresponding simulations of the Earth system with res uh, respect to their suitability and effectiveness and also their side effects. And we look forward to uh, Gian's talk entitled Assessing the Mitigation Potential and Side Effects of ocean-based carbon dioxide removal techniques. The floor is yours, Jiang. We can see your slide. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. So today I will be presenting my talk as part of the Comfort Project uh, on the mitigation potential and side effect of ocean-based carbon dioxide removal techniques. Um, so I guess everyone here is already very familiar with the Paris Agreement and the goal to hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 Celsius degree and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degree above industrial levels. And in the last few years, it has become uh, increasing, increasingly clear that in order to achieve this goal, we will need to reach net negative CO2 emissions. And in order to do so, it is very likely that we will have to employ carbon dioxide removal or CDR. Uh, this method um, comes with um, uh, sustainability concerns as well as social and environmental risk, uh, especially when we are deploying them at a large scale. So in this work, I'm presenting the, my research on two different ocean CDR methods using a, a simulation uh, done in a, a system model. So the first method is ocean alkalinization. Uh, for this method, we simulate the addition of alkalinity to the surface ocean in order to increase its capacity to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, by adding alkalinity, we can also uh, combat to a certain extent the effect of ocean acidification of the surface ocean. In our simulation, we are deploying this method on a very large scale, on a global scale. So alkalinity is added to the surface ocean um, wherever it is ice-free throughout the years. And uh, in our scenario, we plan to deploy it from 2025 to the end of the century in 2100. The second method is uh, macroalgae farming and sinking to the ocean floor. Um, in our simulation, we simulate the seaweed growing on floating infrastructure in the open ocean. Similar to the previous method, we are applying it on a very large scale uh, on all open ocean uh, that is ice free uh, from 2025 to 2100. And in our simulation, the seaweed will grow and absorb carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. And then once a year, they are sunk to the bottom of the ocean floor where they are kept away from the atmosphere for a long period of time, from 100 years to 1,000 years. Uh, for both of these methods, we are uh, looking at um, large-scale deployment instead of more realistic uh, deployment, because we want to understand the kind of upper limit of the potential as well as side effect. And in order to study them, uh, I'm applying them with different CO2 emission scenarios. So in this plot here, you can see four different CO2 emission scenarios. The very high emission scenario, where we double our current level of emission by 2050. Then we have a medium or intermediate scenario where we maintain the current levels of emission until the middle of the century. And then we have a low emission scenario or the act now scenario where we reduce our emission significantly and reach net zero by 2070. After that, we have net negative emissions. And the final scenario is the overshoot scenario or the act later scenario. In this one, we follow the high emission trajectory until 2040. And then from then on, we uh, drastically reduce our emission, reach net zero, and then follow by stronger net negative emission compared to the low emission scenario. So for both of these methods, in order to reach net um, negative emission, we are already implying that we need to uh, employ some kind of um, carbon dioxide removal. But in my research, I will be applying the two methods I mentioned earlier on top of them, so they are additional CDR. So for organization, I'm applying them on all four emission scenarios, 
But for the macro RG farming, I'm only applying it on one scenario, the overshoot scenario. So this is um, a summarize of the result that I have from running many simulations within my model. Uh, what we're looking at is the surface air temperature rise relative to pre-industrial. What you see here is a different trajectory of a different scenario. The solid line showed the uh, mean outcome uh, under the different emission scenario that I mentioned in the previous slide. The dot dashed line correspond to the same emission scenario, but with added uh, ocean organization on top. And for the overshoot scenario, we also, we also have the dotted line, which is when we apply macroalgae farming and sinking. So as Dirk has mentioned before, more emissions of um, CO2 into the atmosphere will lead to increase in surface air temperature. In the very high emission scenario, we reach more than four degree warming by the end of the century. In the medium scenario, we still end up with more than two Celsius degree rise. Only in the low emission scenario and the overshoot scenario that we can end up with somewhere between 1.5 and 2 degree temperature rise. However, it is uh, important to keep in mind that we reach a higher temperature during the middle century before decreasing to that period. So we do cross the two level, a two degree threshold somewhere during this century. By applying additional CDR, it can help us bring down this peak and as, uh, as well as uh, bring down the uh, level of warming by the end of the century. Uh, you can see the summarized um, quantity in this table here. This is without additional CDR added. We end up somewhere between 1.5 and 2 degrees, as I mentioned, in the two lower scenario. Uh, for higher, um, so higher emission scenario, CDR doesn't do much. Um, not enough relative to reduce your thing emissions, basically. For additional organization, we can bring the warming down, but only by not point uh, one three degree in three scenario and only not point one degree in the high emission scenario and this is something we do see not in just our simulation but in other research as well that the efficiency of CDR depends on the background uh, CO2 concentration and we can end up with lower efficiency at higher CO2 concentration background for the macro RG farming in this case we do see a, a bigger reduction in temperature compared to organization, but this very much depends on the deployment. We are deploying both of them on extremely large scale here. The um, change in surface air temperature and CO2 concentration will then lead to different changes in the um, Earth system, including changes in the ocean. Um, one example here is the pH in the surface ocean. By uh, When we have a, a large increase in temperature, we will continues to see a decrease in the pH of the surface level uh, corresponding to stronger acidification. By reducing the warming and lowering atmospheric CO2, we see a, re a recovering trend in the surface pH level. Um, however, even when we apply CDR, which does improve the, the rate of recovery for both of these scenarios, we do not um, reach the historical or industrial level we can bring it closer to the current day period, uh, current day levels, however. And this is uh, it's important to note that this is the surface level trend. When we're looking at deep ocean, we tend to see um, a continual decline throughout the century and beyond because of the committed warmings in the system. So um, this next uh, slide, I will be talking about the, uh, the likelihood of avoid a certain threshold. For example, in the first case we're looking at is surface air temperature warming uh, with a threshold of 1.5 Celsius degree. For the three scenarios of the overshoot without additional, um, without additional CDR, uh, with uh, additional organization with seaweed and uh, farming and sinking. The light temperature, uh, the light color mean that we have a high probability of staying below this threshold. By dark color mean that we are very likely to exceed that threshold. So as mentioned before, we are very likely to exceed the 1.5 degree threshold under all these scenarios. The dots here indicate the most likely time of crossing the threshold. So by deploying um, macro algae farming and thinking we can buy some time by pushing back the, the date of crossing the threshold. However, it's only by a few years. Again, we see very similar trend for steric sea level rise. Um, this is uh, only the thermal contribution to the sea level rise, so it doesn't include melting from glacier. Uh, again, we see that maybe we can push back the crossing of the threshold by a few years, but also we can see that we can lower the probability of crossing it. And then we have the surface pH level, uh, as I showed in the previous slide. 
this is a, an overshoot scenario. So even without additional CDR, we do have negative emission by the end of the century. So we do see a recovering trend. However, we are already crossing some threshold during the, the middle of the century. And um, a crossing of such a threshold can come with some um, impacts on the ecosystem, which can or cannot be um, reversible. Uh, by adding additional CDR, we can bring down the probability or avoid the crossing of such a threshold. Uh, the situation in the deep ocean, however, is quite different. We will see a continual decline in ocean, ocean oxygen concentration throughout the century, even with uh, a, a smaller cooling in the atmosphere and a recovering trend in the surface. Um, actually, in the case of macroalgae farming, this uh, situation actually gets worse because it creates more deoxygenation in the deep ocean where we sink the biomass down. So this is a, an, uh, an example of an unintended side effect of the CDR technique. It has a larger uh, impact on these two quantity and may buy us some time, but that come at a cost. And with that, I would like to um, just end with some key takes away. So the most important thing is that while additional CDR does increase the probability of staying below the 1.5 or 2 degree threshold, but there's only after significant reduction in emissions already. Uh, even with stabilized emissions and decreasing surface air temperature, many trends continue to due to committed warming, especially trends in the deep ocean. Additional CTR can help us combat acidification at the surface layer to a certain extent, but overall it has very small impact despite the massive scale deployment in my research. And the, um, the deployment of such a CTR does come with a side effect, for example, macro algae farming and sinking uh, cause a redistribution of oxygen over the entire ocean, which can have uh, detrimental impacts on the marine ecosystem. So my final point is that um, CDR can be useful uh, for certain uh, application, but it is not an alternative to emission reduction. And with that, I would like to uh, conclude my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jiang. Uh, this is a very, very interesting uh, contribution to the CDR discussion and very important one. Um, there is, uh, um, yeah, um, uh, I, I just look whether there's a direct question to you. Um, but we can, uh, as said before, we will have a discussion section at the end of the workshop where uh, people can ask questions. I don't see any raised hand so far, then maybe we uh, thank you again very much uh, for this nice presentation. And then we, um, uh, I would like to invite uh, Rolf Rödven uh, 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 for the next presentation. So uh, Rolf uh, has actually a PhD in, in Northern Populations and Ecosystems and also a Master's in Strategic Leadership and Finance. Uh, so he is a quite versatile person and he is uh, uh, the Executive Secretary of the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment program which has uh, provided the very very important input to to uh, to the discussions and the climate change discussion and and management of the earth system and we are very happy that Rolf is uh, is a member of the stakeholder reference group for uh, the comfort project and uh, Rolf will uh, present uh, 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 a talk about adaptations for changing Arctic conditions and processes. Um, please, Rolf, I can see your presentation. It looks perfect. Thank you, and thank you for a nice uh, introduction. Uh, yeah, uh, as I said, as the Christoph just said, um, uh, my name is Rolf Rolf, and I'm the exec executive of AMAP. And today I'm going to talk about adaptations for changing Arctic and just to spoil the presentation from the very beginning, I'm not going to present any solutions, but I'm more going to talk about conditions and processes. So that was the, the spoiler alert. Um, I'm going to um, refer to five of the uh, AMAP assessment reports in my talk. Uh, those you can see on the screen now, three of them on adaptation actions for changing Arctic uh, for the three regions, uh, Bering, Chuchi, Beaufort region, uh, the Barents Sea, as well as the Baffin uh, Bay Davis Strait region. But also, I'm going to refer to our uh, climate change update from 2021 and our ocean acidification uh, report from 2018. I guess, first, uh, as some of you may not be aware of AMAP, I'm just going to say a very 
very short some few few words. Um, AMAP is a working group to the Arctic Council uh, with a mandate to to monitor and assess levels of and effects of uh, pollutants in all components of the Arctic environment, as well as uh, effects of climate change on Arctic ecosystems and also their impacts on human health and also interactions with multiple stresses. Um, we do so. Um, we also deliver policy recommendations to Arctic foreign ministers, as well as to um, international conventions like uh, uh, the Stockholm Convention, the Minamata Convention on Mercury, IPCC, and UN Environment in, in general. And we're very happy to be a part of this, this very interesting project. Speaking of adaptations, uh, first just want to focus also a bit on, on conditions on land. We heard a lot about uh, Arctic warming for for the sea, but uh, however, most people spend most of the time on on land rather than in the sea. So I just wanted to, to refresh our memory here. Um, and in our latest climate update report, we do uh, state that for the last 50 years, we see that the Arctic warms three times faster than the global average. Um, there's more than three degrees uh, Celsius uh, changing or increase in surface temperature almost 10% more precipitation, most of it as rain. The permafrost has been, we've been heard, hearing about today, has increased by two to three degrees uh, during the last 50 years. Um, there is way less snow in spring. Uh, the sea ice uh, extension has almost halved since 1979. And there's a massive loss of um, land-based uh, ice mass on, from Greenland, as well as other glaciers in the Arctic. And as we heard several times today, it also have some of the fastest raised oh, rates of ocean acidification. And this, the reason for the rate is often, often um, explained by Arctic amplification. We heard about it already, but uh, um, I guess I could just say that the change is taking place faster, uh, stronger uh, and earlier in the Arctic than elsewhere at the moment. So to understand how this affects um, the societies, we need to first introduce the societies. Um, and I guess for most of us sitting here in, in Norway, we do, um, we do sit in a very uh, unrepresentable part of the Arctic if you compare it to the, to, to the Pan-Arctic uh, state. So Arctic is home to about 4 million people, about 10% of them um, define themselves belonging to one of the 40, more than 40 ethnic groups. There's a, there's a very um, skewness in, in the structure of settlements. So 74%, almost two thirds of the people live in, in towns larger than 5,000 cities. However, 90% of the settlements are small. So we do have a few uh, highly inhabited towns, but uh, most of the settlements are very small and spread all around uh, the, the, the Arctic. And more than half or 64% of the settlements are located on permafrost, which of course, affect their, their livelihood. So for those people living in those, those societies adapting to climate change, um, they have to adapt to not only climate change, but to a complex um, scenario changes taking place in the Arctic. Uh, this slide shows, uh, first and foremost, it shows the Arctic as seen from above with those three reports. Uh, shown on the screen with, with uh, uh, the three region, regions shown on screen uh, from the three reports with different colors, green, yellow, and, and uh, purple. Um, however, though a lot of the change in the Arctic is um, induced by or driven by, by um, greenhouse gas emission and climate change and their secondary effects, there are also a lot of other changes taking place like an increased uh, development of oil and gas industry and mining industry. Um, this local development, increased shipping in some areas, we do see a strong increase in, in recreation, tourism use, uh, and uh, also change in, in infrastructure. All of these are pressures that um, local residents in the Arctic have to, to face and adapt to. And, and the, um, the, the, the um, possibilities of adapting if, if, is, of course, um, restricted by the full scenario, and not only just climate change.
So, um, just to start off with the principle, uh, as most of you know, like the interaction between societies and ecosystems are often uh, defined as social, social ecological systems, and they also describe how this dynamics takes place in the Arctic. So, so on the right hand side here, you see the green um, ecosystem side. So if you have like um, uh, a driver like uh, greenhouse gas emission causing um, climate change and then again causing a change in ecosystem structure and processes, this will affect ecosystem functions and by them affecting ecosystem services, providing well-being to societies living in the Arctic. Depending on, on both the, the um, magnitude and direction of these, um, this change, as well as the, the capability of adapting, the societies have to, to, to adapt to, to uh, that change in, in uh, existing service provision. This again can be neutral as, as we often think of it, but also it can, be, it can uh, spill back to, to the ecosystem. In, in a positive and negative way. And, and in particular, when it comes to positive ways, we often call it um, adaptive management. When you adapt uh, your management of the ecosystem in a way that it will dampen the effects of climate, uh, climate change. Or you can also call it, as, as we just heard about, like uh, nature-based solutions for, for mitigating climate change. Um, to move a bit more into detail, uh, I would like to focus on, on two of the case studies from Art or um, Arctic Ocean acidification assessment. We looked into two societal impacts of, of um, acidification of, of the Arctic Oceans. Um, the report contains five case studies and I'm going to focus on, on the one on to the very east uh, in the Barents Sea and, and one to the very west in, in Alaska. Yeah, to, to, to kind of describe the magnitude these impacts can have on societies as well as the uh, capability of adapting to, to those. Um, first, in our report we did, um, there, there is <clears throat> one of the chapters is modeling uh, the effect of the combined or the combined effect of uh, acidification and, and warming um, on, on the Barents uh, Sea cod stock and in particular on how it increases the juvenile mortality. Uh, the modeling of, of uh, in this paper shows that to, to maintain the same kind of risk regime that you would like to, to have for your fishery management, you have to actually uh, reduce the annual catch reduction from 900,000 tons to 150,000 tons. To, so almost by, or to more or less like one sixth and, and similar the revenue in this here shown in US dollars to in this case, the Norwegian national budget will be reduced in similar ways. So on the national level, this is of course of uh, a rather significant um, importance. However, when we look on a more uh, local scale uh, to understand how uh, this impacts societies and how uh, adaptations can take place, we need to understand um, the capability and, and vulnerability to, to such changes. So in, in the other study here from Alaska, uh, we do uh, look into disaster risk by combining um, our understanding of vulnerability, the human exposure and, and hazard, in this case, ocean desertification too, and how it affects uh, the disaster. This slide shows the result of, of, of that um, assessment, um, where areas marked in red are, are areas with high risk, yellow are medium risk, and blue are low risk uh, areas, in, in this case, uh, provinces of, of um, Alaska. Um, <clears throat> the, the general take-home messages from the, the simulation is that um, the, uh, the more diversity uh, of the society, the, the more capable it is to adapting. So the less um, prone it is to, uh, or less prone the industries are to, to um, ocean acidification by having um, a diversity of industries, by having a diversity of of um, income in society, uh, a balanced gender um, situation, as well as uh, I said, a, a diversity in, in the, um, the dependency of fisheries that would increase the resilience in this case, and also then of course the capability of, of actually doing adaptations without, or if you do not have the, the ability to, to kind of buffer the impact, you will neither have the 
ability to kind of bounce, uh, rebound or bounce back and, and, and adapt. So, so this, the, the conclusion actually um, is contradictive to, to the traditional Tayloristic regime of, of uh, industrialization. However, it's very um, in line with, with what we know from ecology, where we do see that diversity is a way of any system to buffer uh, a, a perturbation in the system. So looking more back to the, the Barnes Sea uh, situation and, 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 uh, um, and um, uh, different kind of, of um, societal incomes and, and conditions there. Um, this slide shows on the, on the lower left side, it shows fisheries and it shows how, um, how fisheries are not, you can't um, discuss adaptations in fisheries without discussing the, the um, uh, dynamics of, of other uh, parts of, of the society or the complex, complexity of the societal system. So, so as you can see here on the left-hand side, fisheries are um, impacted by an northward shift in marine species, which again could be, be adapted by uh, market adjustments, by um, uh, uh, being able to, to sell new fish species on instead of those you usually will, will, uh, would have been fishing on. However, when it comes to ocean certification, that is much harder to, to predict because we, we do not know the exact effects uh, and neither do we. Um, it has more like a, an all over mortality effect rather than um, just a shift in, in species composition. Uh, this of course is also dependent on, for instance, on, on offshore and onshore petroleum uh, development and how, how that will kind of compete with, with space and, and, and recruitment and so on. Uh, but also on other factors of, of the um, society. However, uh, looking into the uh, adaptations required, they, you can categorize them in, in uh, some different categories that are listed up on the right hand side. Uh, like you have um, adaptations that require technical solutions and innovation and infrastructural improvements. Um, some of them require regulatory mechanisms. Uh, in particular, when it comes to regulating the, the national need for, for adaptation to the or mitigation and the, the local need. And, and we do have now and all just seen an example of that with a conflict between the local need for, for pastures along rain herders um, and the, the national need of, of wind power plants to, to supply um, the energy market with, with green energy. So that is like one, one such conflict that needs regulatory mechanisms. In many uh, very often it also needs new economic mechanisms to, to support those changes. Innovation into ship, uh, new knowledge as we just had described here, as sometimes new institutional structures, production practices, and also as already, already said, um, adaptations are taking place on different scales, which also need then require cross-sectoral sectoral interactions. So then, just to conclude, so uh, from our um, Barnes uh, C report or Barnes report, Barnes region report, we do recommend that adaptations need to be considered as a part of a long term proactive process um, that encourages holistic thinking, among others. Uh, and that, that is um, in contrast to what we often see now, like a local, very topic specific, um, reactive adaptation on what, ha what is happening and not what is going to happen. And to be able to do so, there's a need to de develop analytical frameworks and practical tools that can support analysis of adapt adaptive cap capacities and resilience, as you just seen, as they are crucial for the ability to adapt, in particular for local societies. And one way to, to be able to do so is to uh, use scenarios. They provide, they provide a tool for examining the robustness of adaptations options uh, in the face of, of different potential futures. So you can actually compare um, or find the optimal way of adapting to, to, this, to a complexity of, of change. And we do need to, to support uh, partitioning processes that encourage knowledge sharing and social learning, um, in particular as it will, will um, resolve uh, conflicts in, in many ways. And uh, the last one is to that adaptation need to be analyzed in a multi-level governance perspective. That includes attention to allocation of decision-making power, as we just as I just spoke about. Like the sometimes you have um, 
a different solution for, for local adaptations to national adaptations, as well as to, to international adaptations. And by that, I conclude my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rolf, um, for this very uh, instructive and nice presentation. And um, um, we are very happy about this. And uh, also the, the, the very constructive list of, of recommendations. That's, that's highly appreciated. There are direct uh, responses to Rolf's talk. So I just look in whether there's a raised hand or not. Um, wait a few seconds. Um, but as as said before, we have the the discussion section still at the end of the of the workshops, and I I continue and and uh, and and share my screen and um, jump right into the into the small presentation that I have uh, made at the end here. I hope uh, this is working for you. So. Um, uh, uh, and um, um, I would start uh, like to start with uh, with uh, three main uh, categories how we can take action in order to prevent uh, the occurrence of tipping uh, uh, um, uh, crossing tipping points in the system and regime shifts and also general also uh, impacts due to smooth warming and uh, and uh, other changes in the earth system and of course one of the first uh, this is from the ipcc um, special report on ocean and cryosphere very nice summary and uh, the first uh, uh, or the big pillars are uh, here in the, uh, marked in uh, these red circles first is the ad addressing the causes of climate change of course uh, mitigation uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and other uh, measures in order to bring down the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere and possibly also um, uh, in, in the ocean. Um, the second uh, pillar of, uh, of possible actions is uh, to support biological and ecological adaptation. There are, um, for example, very uh, intriguing results uh, from, uh, from the tropical uh, area concerning um, um, the safeguarding of coral reef systems and restore, restoring them. Uh, it's not uh, uh, clear how successful uh, these attempts will be in the end, but it's certainly one thing. Another aspect is the conservation and maybe um, uh, restoration of, of mangrove forests and so forth. Uh, and um, uh, in, in, uh, in Norway, it's maybe uh, more associated with the restoration of, of certain um, land ecosystems uh, in order to prevent outgassing from the soils. Uh, and then the third pillar is enhancing societal adaptation and uh, an, an example in the worst case uh, that one needs to relocate people who are uh, living uh, close to the sea level. And um, uh, Jörg in his talk has already mentioned this TCRE, so this relationship between the cumulative um, CO2 emissions over time and uh, on the x-axis and uh, the uh, the temperature increase and so this gives a first order um, uh, um, view on what should be done so the most effective thing is to uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of course um, uh, one question is how to uh, how to possibly remove the carbon dioxide the excess carbon dioxide from human activities from the earth system i don't go into details it's just to show you that there are a variety of these negative emissions technologies uh, around uh, jiang has mentioned acidification and the seaweed uh, marine uh, cdr method but there are others but most of them have uh, 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 some negative side effects or are not technically ready maybe apart from the the land um, the biosphere um, uh, options uh, so and, and in principle in order to have massive uh, effect of this uh, cdr this needs to be uh, up uh, upscaled and implemented uh, in, in seven years from now so from 2030 on and this is not uh, uh, really realistic so um 
the situation that we are in in the moment is uh, that uh, this is a, a graph from the uh, the United Nations Environment Program gap report. So what, how far are we away from this 1.5 degree goal? And uh, to be re uh, realistic, it's probably not uh, reachable anymore. Um, so if one looks at uh, the the nationally determined contributions to the to the reduction uh, of CO2. Um, uh, then um, uh, even with a huge additional effort, still a realistic uh, possibility, but it's not very probable. So we may reach 2.3 degrees, but it probably will be around 2.5 or 2.8 degrees. So time will show how, uh, how uh, uh, humankind is still able to turn around uh, the wheel. Um, uh, I'm now leaving my uh, my main expertise and um, I'm telling a, a little bit more concrete things which uh, came to my mind and and also what I have um, uh, uh, received as input from uh, from others. Um, I mean, the key greenhouse gas emission reduction buttons are, first of all, the, the energy system. So the change to renewables, uh, increased efficiency of energy system. The second one, the big pillar is agricultural practice and food production and also the diet. So what we eat and how we produce that, what we eat. And uh, Norway is uh, one of, uh, of uh, I think it's uh, the, 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 um, the food production is one of the key industries in Norway, so it they can uh, probably have a big impact here. And the third pillar is urban planning, so to avoid path lock-ins to, to make cities, and many Norwegians live in cities, um, uh, uh, really uh, um, greenhouse gas emission friendly uh, cities so that uh, one can reduce emissions here and if one if one misses the the train here then one is locked in over over several decades because one cannot uh, reinvest uh, big amounts of money again and again <laughs> i come now to some more general things it's of course uh, necessary also to have a more um, uh, overall resource management, circular economies in order to bring down the, the uh, emissions, uh, reduce the mining activities where possible and reuse materials. Then uh, to uh, opt for uh, infrastructure shifts like train uh, systems where there's uh, flying and in general lifestyle changes. So um, less is more and uh, have a qualitative growth in the case of quantitative growth, I think the sustainable development uh, goal on, on the economic growth has to be uh, seen a little bit more critical and may, I would recommend to revise it actually. Um, but uh, going back a little bit to the science, so how to adapt best and I think that, uh, that uh, we cannot mitigate uh, uh, the entire climate change anymore, but uh, we can help to uh, societies to adapt. And for example, one thing we could can do and use our models and our knowledge is and then together with social scientists and other uh, uh, medical uh, and, and psychological experts to determine optimal relocation pathways for climate migrants, for example, so that they not not that they don't move to areas which are the next uh, in, in, in under threat. Um, uh, scientists can help to optimize use of CDR methods, uh, for example, how and where to reforest a forest or what uh, uh, else could be done in order to, to optimize the carbon dioxide removal techniques. Then also we can help to optimize environmental management. Um, for example, fish quota under multiple different stressors, uh, how to um, optimize the system that we have enough to eat in the future. And uh, I think one lever which is a little bit underestimated is the bundling of research and management efforts. I think that is necessary. There's a still a, a big fragmentation. So I think there's a lot of knowledge around. There's a lot of goodwill around and a good, a good, a good a large amount of political goodwill to, to solve problems. But um, there is a, a, string, a lack of stringency and, and, and to, to implement changes in a, in, a, in, a, in a short time, even if there would be the, the, the legislation around. So there I, th I think are, are important, these are important things. And I would like to stop here uh, my short pre presentation at the end. Um, uh, uh, but uh, before I, I 
close uh, the, the presentation part. I would like to thank the organizers of this workshop. First of all, it's Dagmara, who, uh, Dagmara Ruzietska from, from Bergen, who put a lot of uh, time and effort and diplomacy into getting this uh, um, uh, uh, or in order to realize that, that workshop. Big thank you to Dagmara. And I, I would like to thank also um, uh, Giuliano, uh, who, uh, who just joined uh, our team in Bergen for also helping in running this uh, so smoothly. And also Gudrun Sülte and um, of course, and uh, at the Bjergnes Center for Climate Research. And all I would like to thank all the speakers and the participants, but we are not finished uh, as yet. So because we have now, I would like to open the discussion uh, and question and answer section. So if you have any, uh, any comments, recommendations, Congratulations, critics, comments, uh, these are very welcome. You also can contact us later on uh, if you if you would like uh, to, and we are, would be happy to continue to have a dialogue with you also further on. And uh, so um, then I'm waiting for raised hands or uh, comments in the chat. So whatever you, uh, you prefer. And um, waiting for a few seconds so you have enough time to think about yes there is ingun lead ingun uh, do you see me now yes yeah and we can hello. hear you <laughs> yes <laughs> hello uh I would just like to say that thank you very much for this very interesting workshop. It's really interesting. And also we have got this policy brief from you earlier. It's also very interesting. So we, I will uh, give this information uh, to others, of course, and has done. Uh, and um, yes, is it also possible, you think, to uh, the, your recording that I can share that with uh, others in the ministries and the research council. Yes, of course. So we will place we will place mm -hmm. it at some uh, at some uh, some uh, some point uh, where it's all publicly accessible. But we can also send you the files if you if you if you if mm -hmm. you want to. So this is, this is of course welcome, and this is one of the 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 purposes that we recorded that we want to have it spread. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, Petra. Maybe interesting to know for some of you, uh, especially maybe Ingun, that from Tipax we're working also on another policy brief uh, talking about all the different uh, results from the TIPAX projects in particular. So really about the Southern Ocean and Antarctic tipping points. So this will come sometime during this year and I'm happy to share that as well with you, with all of you. Yes, thank you. Are there other other messages and or uh, words. Um, I hope this was useful for you, for some of you and maybe, yeah, Petra. Can I refer the question? So is there, um, what kind of information is most useful for, for policymakers? So should we give more numbers, more like general recommendations? Um, just explaining how the processes work. What is most useful for you? Well, I, I, I don't know. Maybe for you, Aurora, or for Ingun, Mariana. Um, I don't know. Maybe a few of you can give some answers. That's very useful for us when we make these policy recommendations that they're actually useful. <laughs> yes, Ingun. Yes, uh, I think for me, you have a lot of uh, very relevant information on your websites. So I use your websites a lot when I give information about the projects to the ministries. Mm -hmm. very so good. I know, I know, of course, uh, the 
about the uh, Arctic and Antarctic, the polar issues, the uh, the Kunskaps Departement is very interested in the, in the Horizon Europe projects and your outcomes. So you are very welcome to send us information and we will send that, uh, of course, to to also, of course, to the Climate and Environment Ministry. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that that that's uh, that, uh, that's very good. I mean, uh, um, uh, uh, Rolf, maybe you can can uh, can uh, give us some some uh, some uh, insight into how you interact with with government agencies and with uh, with political scientists and with agencies and with the people uh, the local people and what what in order and in, in according to you to your insight works best. Thank you. That's a that's a long that's a short question, but a long answer, I guess. I but, know, uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I would think it's uh, yeah. As you say, we AMAP has been working in the polar uh, science policy interface for more than thirty years, and, and data from from the Arctic were uh, quite crucial for establishing the uh, Stockholm Convention on regulating uh, pers persistent organic pollutants, as well as Minamata Convention regulating uh, mercury. Uh, and there are, there are actually some nice papers by um, Eric Steindahl and his co-workers on actually on the, the process in full for those who would like to read. Um, I would say, and uh, I guess uh, Marianne, uh, I think she, if she's, she's still here, so she could um, comp could could um, add in on this. But I, I do think the the like a close interaction between policymakers and 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 experts is kind of crucial for this because mm -hmm. um, science to Policy is not a one-way process, as it may sound like. It's a two, it's a, it's two-way process. So, so what you need to define, or what we have found very essential to define, is the, the, what is the policy-relevant questions. What are the what are the, the needs for the policymakers, as well as what are, what are the knowledge gaps seen from the expert side, and and what is available. So you can kind of so you can put together what it, what do you want to know, what is possible to 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 know and understand, and 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 how do we uh, bring this bring this forward? Um, and then, of course, and that's of course the first step we, we assess when we do our assessment reports. But then, of course, it's the the, the um, communication and dissemination of, of the results as well, where we work very close with with, um, uh, for instance, the, the secretariat under the UN environment uh, to ensure that our processes are timelined with their processes. So we know that our data will feed into the international processes that they write in a, in a timely manner. So, so that is quite crucial. It doesn't help if you have the best results, if they're there at the wrong time, they won't be, they won't be um, adopted into, into uh, uh, the, the work under your environment because you, you kind of lost the deadline. So, so I guess that's kind of the short answer, but I guess also Marianne can, can add in on this. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, originally Aurora was first and then Marianne. Then we take Aurora first. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so I think in general, it's uh, from my side, it's, it's useful to get this overview of the whole tipping point problem. Um, it's of course interesting to, to know all the processes and things. Um, but for myself, I need to understand this in a way that I can communicate this further. So quite um, clear uh, messages. Um, and also, uh, I think we're interested in, okay, so this this might happen, but what does it mean? I mean, the impacts, you said it was less research on that. So I think that'll be very important in the future. And also, when we know what it means, uh, what, what can we do about it? Um, if science can give us some answers, uh, that would be very helpful, but I understand it's um, incredibly complicated. Yeah. Yeah, th yeah, thank you very much. I may, I, I may, uh, may respond uh, to this, but maybe also others uh, can respond to this. Um, I think that with this, with these um, abrupt changes and also with the extremes, we are just starting to to understand this, and it's uh, it's quite clear that we have that extreme events in the ocean which have these causes regime shifts increase with. Uh, 
with um, climate forcing. So if we if we have a stronger climate change, also we have more of these uh, climate extremes, both in frequency and extent. So so and this uh, originally we have looked more or less on like 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 uh, more smooth uh, changes in the, in the ocean and, and looked at, at at thresholds in that way. And um, but this is. Um, uh, something which is new and also that that in the ocean the the observational database is, is as compared to the atmosphere and land is small because the ocean is is inaccessible and it has a long time scale uh, motion but on a small spatial scale so it's so we, many of these abrupt changes have not been detected yet so we can see them in models but not not everywhere in observations also subsurface and observations is very difficult so it's a new topic that uh, one has to take into account probably more things than we have thought before concerning the impacts and in order to estimate the impacts and also to formulate or to to give more quantitative improved uh, Quantitatively, quantitatively improved estimates for optimal adaptation measures. So this is something you wish that one has to take into account. These these uh, these abrupt changes and how they change, whether they, if there are more of such regime, regime uh, shifts, like uh, Friederike has shown for from this heat wave uh, thing in uh, in Australia. If if these they can have a big impact and this is not yet fully quantified so we add to the to the damage matrix so to speak and the risk matrix uh, and 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 want to want of course to to bring that forward to people who can use that information but i'm talking too much maybe i <laughs> we um uh, rolf do, did you want to respond directly to this or is it something separate um i, I can wait I'll... Okay, okay, then we take first Mayana and then Ingun and then Rolf. And I think um, actually, Christoph, but you addressed some of the uh, issues that I wanted to raise. I think in this case, uh, what we see is insight, not necessarily uh, concrete numbers. And that is really useful to us mm. uh, because they sort of, uh, they give a picture of, of, uh, of uh, emerging issues that we need to take into account and uh, so that's really useful. Um, and then I think uh, to me, uh, I'm sort of, yeah, well, I'm mostly engaged in Arctic issues, but to me it's, uh, it's useful with workshops like this because it gives an overview of uh, the state of knowledge, uh, what are the uncertainties, uh, who are working on these issues, mm. uh, how are you working together and so forth? So that's uh, that's uh, really useful. And also, uh, what are the limitations uh, in the knowledge base as it is now? Are mm. there things, are there buttons that we can push? Uh, um, are these issues that we need to raise when we uh, formulate what our knowledge needs are? And so forth. So uh, it's really useful. And, and probably we have two few uh, communication platforms like this mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but of course to uh, to us who work within uh, the governmental agencies we uh, uh, having the opportunity to sit together for a couple of hours like this uh, gives us a lot of insight mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think approximately uh, 1.5 uh, how much is it? Uh, it's a lot of funding going to polar research and it's impossible for us to have an overview. Mm. So having a platform like this once in a while is really useful and uh, it gives us some paces and, and names and contacts. So uh, thank you a lot for that. And then uh, um, those policy briefs, I'll look into those. Uh, mm. Those type of papers are uh, really useful in in our sort of PC. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, then Ingun. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I um, agree very much with what Marianne said. Um, I would also like to inform you that I uh, one week before Easter participated in, uh, on behalf of Norway in a climate change science summit 
So, uh, and the goal uh, for this kind of summit, there will be uh, one in one year from now, uh, when the Bel Belgium have the uh, leadership um, in the EU. Uh, and uh, um, uh, the goal is that the, the climate and environment ministers and the also research ministers uh, agreed to establish a process to determine how to accelerate the transfer of knowledge from science and innovation to climate policy and actions. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's really to highlight, to have a, a dialogue at a high level, uh, at policy level, to, to transfer knowledge to policy uh, and also uh, to really highlight the role of science. So I think for all that we are discussing now and your work and your policy briefs are really uh, very welcome into this process. So I think, uh, and it was 12 countries that participated and were very committed to this process. So, and uh, in the year that will come, uh, there will be uh, more, uh, uh, high-level people that will commit to this process and I can send you some information about it so and um, in the research council uh, we would also like to to have dialogue with you um, uh, during this year about this uh, and there are also uh, uh, plans for a partnership in Horizon Europe that uh, uh, you are also welcome to give input to so I can send that to one of you and you can find out who is the best to to give us input. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, Ingrid. Um, uh, that, that's, uh, that's, ve that's very good to, uh, to hear and uh, thank you for this input. I also want to mention that in the chat there, Carsten uh, uh, put an information about uh, uh, a consultation open for the EU climate target for 2040 in the framework of the European climate law. So that is uh, uh, very interesting. And there is a question there uh, that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, also, also offers the option to, to attach policy papers and so forth. So thank you. Thank you, Carsten, for that. Um, then I think uh, Rolf. I think my point was uh, taken by, by Marana to a large degree. Okay. Um, I just... Uh, and I just want to echo also Roran on her statement about imp the importance of uh, stating impacts. Uh, policy making is often trading one process against this other and to be able to kind of compare the value of those two, it's, it's we found very, mm -hmm. very important. So also mm -hmm. for scientists to ask ourselves like why, why is actually this important for, for policy makers? And, and like for instance, when it comes to climate change, we, we trade the, the the long-term well-being towards the, the short-term well-being. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so to be able to, to put that into a currency that is translatable between those two processes is, is very important. And that can mm -hmm. be done by, by mm -hmm. stating the impacts. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Um, are there further questions or comments? So we are approaching uh, slowly the, the end of the allocated uh, time slot for this workshop. Um, so, uh, as I said before, we, uh, all of the, the, the speakers uh, uh, and the managers uh, in, included in this, uh, in this workshop, uh, we, are, we are available for further information or for discussions um, at any time. So you can, can contact us uh, uh, at our uh, institutes and we will be happy. And we can also arrange for other meetings with you and to, for the, to discuss if, if necessary. Um, we are also preparing, in a, a, and I think it's probably the same in, in TIPAX, but uh, in, in, in Comfort, for which I know know better from the inside, we are preparing a series of synthesis uh, papers also where we try to summarize the results of of, of four years of, of ocean tipping point research and coupled physical, chemical, biological realm. 
and um, we try to make these um, accessible for for any educated reader so that uh, you, you can also get a good if you want to get a go a little bit more into detail you will uh, hopefully benefit from these synthesis as well so this is under under work and also you are uh, very welcome to contact our or to look at our websites from from um, uh, comfort and tipax and and other eu projects also in the uh, in uh, that are dealing with climate change and tipping points and other important issues and um, we as scientists we are always happy if people are actually interested in 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 what we do and 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 can use it and and we are keen on on this dialogue as well so so um, and we are also um, on the learning ladder all the time with respect to that process and we want to make not only our uh, we, our local environment and and, and research uh, environment happy but we are also aware that we want to contribute or we are we want to contribute to tackling some key uh, uh, challenges that societies have uh, these days um, so if uh, I wait for a few seconds, if there are any final final uh, things that people want to, uh, want to ask, uh, possibly. Otherwise, I think uh, that was a, a very pleasant morning for me, as uh, and it was very easy to to uh, to do uh, uh, the moderation. Thank you for that, and thanks again, uh, Doug Mara and all the others in the organizing team and uh, U.S. speakers and as audience. It was a pleasure to have you and uh, then I uh, wish you a nice uh, day and uh, with this uh, recording will be made available. It, it will take a few days to, to process it and uh, then um, uh, you can uh, again look at it if you like, if you want. Yeah, thank you very much. Then I uh, close this workshop and uh, wish you a, a, a nice day.